Well, we have been blessed. You know, this has been a, a little bit shorter time, but it's been very, very sweet. One of the things that I love to hear from are uh, folks that, that aren't just in full-time ministry, as in a pastoral ministry, but folks that are business people. And oftentimes they approach things from a little bit different perspective than we do. And it's a challenge to us. It's an encouragement to us. And so when I knew that John Bongiorno was uh, leading World Serve International, I thought, man, that's what I, I, I want to hear from him. I, I want to hear what God has put on his heart. Last night, if, if you guys meditate on that message, we, we were to walk away with three words, okay? God's called us to be soldiers. Now, I have a certain mentality when it comes to thinking of a soldier, but then the next word, I'm a saint because of what God's done for me, because of the covering of Jesus Christ. And because of that covering of Jesus Christ, I'm a servant. So I, I was pondering that last night. How can you be a soldier and how can you be a servant? That's what God's kingdom is all about. A soldier stands firm. A soldier is not easily moved. And a soldier is about the business of the king. So I, I trust you were blessed as I was last night, and I'm looking forward to tonight. Brother John, come and share your heart with us. Praise the Lord. Yeah. I do have the mic turned on, so if you can't hear me, uh, guys, if you just turn it up a little bit. There we go. Well, I'm just so honored to be in Montana. I hear that report at lunch today as to how God is using this district and uh, what is happening financially and the missions that you're supporting. And then to know some of the missionaries from this district, you have great missionaries out there. And uh, I'm just uh, so blessed to know them and we're grateful for the impact that the Montana district is having. And I believe that in the coming days that God is going to sweep through this great state it's not a populous state, it's a large state. But God is going to sweep through this state and He's going to do miracles. In fact, I was thinking we should call it Miracle Montana. Because God is going to do powerful things through His church. And I want to speak to you tonight about promises made and promises kept. Promises made and promises kept. And that's not original. You see, I was... Uh, just at the America First Summit in Atlanta, I was invited by Jensen Franklin. His son Drake works for the American First Policy Institute, and Paula White, who was pastor to John Donald Trump, was there. And uh, I was there with all of these different uh, political people, many of you see on Fox News all of the time. And uh, it was a very interesting time for me. I heard about the highest crime rates in decades, the highest suicide rates recorded, especially among teens. We've never seen anything like what has happened in the last few years. Then I heard about the immigration crisis, and if you watch Fox News, you're, you're seeing that unfolding before us and legislation that's out there right now. We heard about the massive increase in human trafficking because of these porous borders and what's happening in that particular area. Hyperinflation, they talked about. The threat of cyber attacks. The war in Ukraine, we pray today. Uh, God help those people. We have some of our colleagues working there. Many of the public water supplies have been destroyed by the Russian advance and army and uh, uh, we have some of our colleagues that are providing water, water filtration, because the water is no longer clean. We heard about the resurgence of Russian and Chinese imperialism and totalitarianism. Even nuclear war was mentioned. People are alarmed at what is happening in our schools. I heard some, uh, Ralph Reed was there, and I heard some, the stories are just absolutely incredible and lawsuits and people being fired for praying on the sidelines. Think of it. <coughs> Critical race theory, gender identity, stripping of parents' roles in moral formation of their own children, and a multitude of other issues from energy dependence 
corporate and big tech censorship. And around the world, world we have food insecurity, famine, drought, civil wars, people being imprisoned and martyred for their religious beliefs. Today I got it. A notice because we have our team working in Ethiopia, the 20 million Ethiopian people, this isn't covered in the news, because of the war with Tigray and, and uh, the Tigrayan people and the Oromo people and the civil war and the drought, 20 million people could starve to death unless there is a fast intervention. Here in the United States as well, I'm working, as I mentioned last night, with our superintendent, Steve Harris, in the Arizona and Mexico districts to reach Native Americans who are suffering and have been left behind. And they suffered the most dire consequences of COVID. And then they suffer. I talked to one of our Native American pastors today. We stood in the hall and we cried together as we were talking about the plight of Native Americans. And he shared with me that there's 60,000 Native Americans in the state of Montana. And can I tell you that percentages tell us that only 3% know Jesus Christ as their personal savior. But I believe God's going to use Pastor Jay and the others and there's going to be a great revival in the Crow Nation. Yeah. Because even though people have forgotten, we serve a God who has not forgotten the Native American people. Yeah. And he's going to move mightily yeah. as we're working in the Navajo and other places. God is going to move here in the state of Montana. Yeah. He's going to move among the Crow people. Yeah. There's going to be a mighty move of God. Yeah. We're believing God. And Brother Jay, we're praying for you. Yeah. You have an apostolic call to reach these people. And in the name Believe that with all my heart. Now the leadership laid out an action plan and policy pillars to accomplish the task of winning over the minds and the hearts, and I'm quoting, of the American public. And they ended with this statement, promises made will be promises kept. But let me say this emphatically, that their goals cannot be achieved unless they have power. And that's what their working is. They want to be able to regain the power because nothing can happen without the power. In light of all the challenges and the dire circumstances, we are reminded that the early church faced challenges much the same as the church faces today. But what is the action plan? What's our game plan? Without a game plan, we will never accomplish the commission that's before us. Now, the only Gentile author of the scriptures is the physician Luke. And Luke gave us two books, the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles, which might be better called the Acts of the Holy Spirit, Amen. the third person of the Trinity. The work and the challenges that are before us would be impossible without the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts has no formal ending. You've heard this before because it's still being written today because God is still building his church. Now, Jesus spent 40 days with his disciples before he ascended back into heaven. And he instructed them, and he laid out the action plan, the game plan. In Matthew, we know the Great Commission. He tells them to go. You know that the scriptures go into all the world, all the nations, making disciples, baptizing. But in Luke and Acts, it's more recorded that Jesus tells them to wait. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, but I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the 
this city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Again in Acts, he says, on one occasion while he's eating with them, he says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And in their waiting, they received something that would enable them to fulfill the mission. For 10 days, they prayed and waited. We just concluded a 10-day fast before Easter in our church. And I told you the results of what happened. And God is still moving because we waited upon the Lord. And we prayed and we fasted. And we asked God to do something mighty. We asked God to do miracles. And he answered those prayers because when the Father makes a promise, he keeps his promise. Have you ever spent 10 days seeking for God's power? You know, we need to do this, even though all of you have been filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to do it because, you know what, Pastor, we leak. <laughs> and if we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we overflow into others, so we need that fresh touch of God. Acts 2.1 says, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. That's good when the people are together in one place. I'm, I'm glad this COVID thing is getting behind us and we can gather together. There's a dynamic that happens when God's people come together. And I told people, don't get into the habit of just watching online. You need to get back into the church. The church needs you. You're part of the body of Christ. It's not enough to watch it on live streaming. You need to get into the, the church and be assembled with the people of God. There's a dynamic that happens when God's people gather together. Jesus is in our midst. He's here. Two or three gathered. His name is here. We've got more than two or three. But you remember the promise. It's the key book. The key word in the book of Acts. It's 1-8. You know it. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Power. You know... We need power. Amen. Wednesday night, we have a great prayer meeting at James River. We have, across our campuses, close to five, 6,000 people gathering for prayer. And you wonder why God is moving? And one thing that my pastor says all the time, he says, if you can only make one service, come to the prayer service. I thought, wow, isn't that something? Because we usually push... Sunday morning service. And he says, come to the prayer service because it sets the pace for everything that's going to happen in your church. Prayer. Something happens when God's people pray together in unity. When the church is unified, God is glorified. And I, I tell you, I, I'll say this. If any of you would ever like to come, because I'll tell you what happened in our church. Pastor John Lindell went to... to the Brooklyn Tap with Jim Simbola early in his ministry. And Simbola said to him, you need to do this. You need to pray. And if you've been there, and I've had a privilege of speaking at Brooklyn Tabernacle at one of their prayer meetings to talk about some of the projects that we're doing. And can I tell you that John came back a different man. And that Wednesday night service took on a whole different feel. It's so critical that we as the church pray. And then we know that all of them, all of them, every one of those 120 in that upper room, everyone was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Power came upon them. Why? Because it's a wonderful thing to speak in tongues? 
I'm not talking about a prayer language. I was talking with one of our sisters, and she too was challenged to pray in tongues 30 minutes a day. And that's a wonderful gift from God that builds us up. It's wonderful. Power came upon them to witness Amen. and to boldly proclaim the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the word there, you know this, you've heard it before, miraculous, dynamic power, dunamis. You know we get our word dynamite. Miraculous, dynamic powers came upon them when the Holy Spirit came upon them for effective witness and ministry. You know, William J. Seymour, when he led this great Azusa Street Revival, there were so many things that happened there. Miraculous things that happened there. On multiple occasions, the fire department was called because they saw flames. And the people came and they saw flames, but it wasn't a fire. It was the Holy Spirit, the fire of the Holy Spirit. The same fire that we saw there at Pentecost in that upper room. You can read the books if you want. There's two books. You might want to download true stories of the miracles of Azusa Street and beyond by Tommy Winchell. Or you can read Signs and Wonders by Maria Woolworth Etta. Where these miracles that happened in Azusa Street have been recorded through many interviews. They happened. Things that you, you can't believe. Blind eyes open. Legs reformed. <laughs> People say, I don't know if that could happen. Can I tell you something? God could do anything. We believe that. We say it all the time. With God, all things are possible. So if he wants to restore a living, he can do it. Because Jesus did that. And remember when Jesus did these things, he didn't do them because he was God. And yes, he was God. But we love the passage in Philippians. We call it the kenosis where he emptied himself. He emptied himself and he came to earth. Hallelujah. And can I tell you that the miracles that Jesus did here on earth, he did through the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We don't read about miracles before his baptism when the dove came and landed on him. We don't read about miracles. And I'm sure if he had done miracles before that, uh, he would have told his disciples and it would have been recorded in the Gospels. But you don't read. I, there's some old fables, you know, of Jesus making some mud and making a little bird and it comes to life and flies up. <laughs> Jesus did what he did. The miracles that he performed, he did through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We need to remember that. We need the Holy Spirit. Amen. I can tell you about my own family. My great-grandfather came to this country from Sicily to make a better living, and he worked on the railroads at the turn of the century. His name was Filippo. My father, Philip, is named after him. And he was with his cousin Mario. Isn't that a wonderful Italian? Mario. Hey. Mario. <laughs> Mario Maggiorno. Yes, that's right. Felice Mario. And Mario got sick. He got what they called at that time consumption. Today we call it per tuberculosis. And it was almost a death sentence back then because they didn't have the medications to treat it. And the word iron lung, you've heard that, that was to try to treat people with tuberculosis. He was dying. And a man came who had been in Azusa Street had seen the miracles, was touched by God himself. And he came across my grandfather and his cousin Mario. And he said, the Lord can heal you. And he prayed over him. And instantaneously, my cousin Mario was healed of tuberculosis. And today there is a Pentecostal church in Erie, Pennsylvania, because the first one was established by my cousin Mario Bongiorno because of a miracle that occurred from someone who had been in Azusa Street in the presence of God as they prayed together. I'm a product of that. I 
tell you, God wants to do so much. Power is the ultimate purpose. It's not tongues. It's bold witness, miracles, supernatural faith. The key to revival is power. The key to salvation is power. First of all, it's power to witness. The word martuso. You're going to be my witnesses. Martuso or martyrs, where we get that word. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Be my witnesses, martus, in Jerusalem, Judea, and throughout the earth. And I say this in love, please, please. But there are so many people that say they have been filled with the Holy Spirit. But they're afraid to go across the street and invite their neighbor to go to church. Because they had a one-time experience, maybe they spoke in tongues. But is that what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And I believe in the initial evidence, Pastor, don't, don't get me wrong. Don't take my credentials from me. <laughs> you know that. But I just wonder, oh, there's so much more. It's the ability when you're called on the carpets like those disciples were called before the Sanhedrin, threatened and everything else, yet they had the ability to stand strong like the soldiers. They anchored themselves. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't have to tell you about uh, Peter. You know, there's a girl in Nigeria. We're about to launch in northern Nigeria, another drilling team. Dave knows about this. We purchased over a million dollars worth of equipment and Speak the Light has helped us. And in northern Nigeria, there's a group called Boko Haram. Have you heard of them? Yeah. Heard of them? They're a terrorist group. And they kidnap girls. And then they put them up for ransom. They kidnapped 110 girls at a school. This was back in uh, 2018. One of those girls was a born-again, spirit-filled believer named Leah Shariba who had given her life to God at the age of 14, and she was filled with the Holy Spirit. After a period of time, the government of Nigeria decided to negotiate with Boko Haram, and they got the release of 109 girls. There's one girl that was never released. Her name is Leah Sharibu. And the reason she wasn't released is because she wasn't willing to recant. All the other ones, all they had to do was sign something and go before the imam and tell them that they no longer believed in Jesus Christ, but uh, they had converted over to Islam. If they had uh, were willing to do that, they would be released. So 109 girls, the Nebelia said, I can't do that. And in the face of martyrdom, that girl is still in prison. I met her mother recently. And we had a day not too long ago when we, in March 21st, we, we prayed for Leah. I don't say you celebrate, but we had a day where we prayed for her because she's still in prison. And she's been raped multiple times. And now she has two children. And they said, well, you can leave, but you can't take your children with you. And so she's decided to stay right now. Think of it. How can you do that? Wouldn't it be so easy to sign a piece of paper, Pastor? Just sign the paper, you'll meet it, and then move on. But she was not willing to do that. That's the power. That's what the disciples had to do. Secondly, it's power we need for boldness. I, I don't have to tell you about Peter. I, I, you know the story. He cowers before a, a servant girl. But he's the same Peter that preaches on the day of Pentecost. And he tells him exactly what they need to do. He said, you need to repent. You're the ones who crucified Jesus. You didn't keep him down. He, he rose again, and now you need to repent. I mean, he a powerful message. Could have been stoned to death. Could have been killed, but he preached. Let me tell you something. I know in my own life what happened when I had that supernatural experience, when God really filled me again with the Holy Spirit. I've been filled at a young age, but God changed me. He transformed me because the power of the Spirit brings transformation. We're not the same people if we're filled with the Holy Spirit. In my work, I get a chance to meet some very unique guys. I talked about these billionaires. One of them was the co-founder of Home Depot. 
and uh, I was invited to his house. He's neighbors with one of our board members uh, and his father that you all know, Jack Nicholas, uh, the golfer. You had a chance to meet him, uh, David, and you know that uh, Jack is a real man of God. And uh, he called me up, and I was at Bay Hill with district youth directors. And he said, uh, Ken Langone, I should have said his name, keep it between us. <laughs> uh, Mr. Langone, who's Italian, by the way, looks like one of my uncles. <laughs> and uh, I Googled him right away. What do we do? Hey, when somebody, I didn't know him. I know he wrote a book called The uh, Capitalism. I Love Capitalism. And he's given me a signed copy. But I went to his house at the invitation of Jack because he wanted to hear about World Sir and about water. And I went there. And he brought me up into his office. And I mean, the house was for over 40,000 square feet. Colleen, I mean to tell you, how would you like to clean that house? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> and uh, he was there, and he's 86 years old, and he's a native of New York City. And uh, <laughs> we come in, we go into his office, he's got a collection of baseball signed by guys like Stan Usual, Mickey Mantle. He even had a Bay Roof ball, uh, ball there. He had all the Yankee greats, Whitey Ford, uh, those of you that like baseball. I mean, amazing bats, uh, hats. He had a glove worn by Joe DiMaggio. Okay, so we're up in, up in his office, you know, and it's a little bit intimidating, you know? Mm -hmm. Guy's worth uh, six to eight billion dollars, according to Google. That was before the market's gone down the last few days. I don't know what it's worth now. <laughs> but uh, I got off track there, sorry, Pastor. <laughs> but, uh, he says to me, he said, uh, we're, we're talking and making small talk initially, and he wanted to hear about the work of World Serve. And then Jack says to him, oh, John here is an ordained minister. And I'm, oh, no, you just blew my cover. <laughs> and he goes, oh, my God. Uh, uh, just, uh, you know, we're all, he says exactly what he said. Oh, my God. He goes, I've got a, excuse me, Pastor, hell of a dirty mouth. <laughs> he says, but I'll tell you one thing. I don't want to go to hell. He's there, but I think I'm going to spend a hell of a lot of time in purgatory. I'm quoting him. And I looked him right in the eye. And I said, Mr. Van Gogh, you're not going to go to hell. God has something better prepared for you. And I said, the Bible says that if we call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, we can be saved. The Bible tells us if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God is raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. I said, do you believe these things? Because I believe him. The atmosphere changed in that room. For I left that place, he'd given a check for 250000 He never even met us. That boldness, I can tell you, that would never have happened. But the Holy Spirit... When he's upon you, he's going to give you a supernatural boldness to do things and to go places you've never gone before. Jesus. That's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We need the power for miracles. I told you about the great things that are happening in the James River Church. I think of Stephen... He was a deacon, by the way. We talked about the saints last night. And it says, now Stephen was a man full of grace and power. The word again, dunamis. Did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Stephen wasn't credentialed. He wasn't ordained. He wasn't a pastor. He was a deacon. You see why it's so important to preach this in your churches and to pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Wouldn't you love to have a church filled with people like Stephen? Yeah. Wherever he went, something happened. God moved. Miracles took place. But if we don't talk about these things and we don't preach about the Holy Spirit, we're doing a disservice to our people. Started when they're young. David, they're not too young to.
be filled with the Holy Spirit. We have seven, eight-year-old children being filled with the Holy Spirit in our church because our children's pastor is talking about that. You know, I, I thought of El Dad and Me Dad. What names? Wonderful names. <laughs> El Dad and Me Dad. Don't you? Would you like to name your grandchildren El Dad and Dad? You know, but what happened was that Moses, the work for him was so hard, they needed other people uh, to, to help him, to take the load away. Okay? And uh, the Lord came and poured a spirit upon these elders. And they began to prophesy. You know the passage in the Old Testament. But there were two that couldn't come out for whatever reason it was. Their names were Eldad and Medad. And they began to prophesy in the camp. And one of the young men came and told to Joshua. And he went to Moses and he said, Oh, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Won't you stop them? And Moses says, Oh, I wish that all of God's people would be prophets. That's what we need. We need a move of the Holy Spirit that will sweep through the pews, that will give our people boldness and power, that they'll be willing to go and invite their neighbors to church. They'll first of all tell them about Jesus. And if their neighbor is sick, I was in the Y the other day and a guy told me that he was going in for a scan that they think he might have cancer and right there in the locker room and I know he's a heathen this guy he's got a foul mouth and everything I says can I pray for you and he said yes I put my hand right in the locker room I didn't pray screaming loud I put my hand on I said Lord Jim is going in and, and Father you know you love him you care for him you're able to touch his body you're able to heal him you're able to do a miracle when I finished praying, tears running down his eyes. This is why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me move. We have a pastor on Mafia Island. Dave, I don't think you've been to Mafia. You weren't with the youth directors. But Mafia Island uh, is off the coast of Tanzania. And it's 99% Muslim. We had a pastor named Joshua Moshe. Where's Nate? Is he here? I don't know if Nate is here. He might have left already and it's like coming right in. Is Nate here? Do you know Pastor Moshe, right? Yes. Uh, God called him to that island. He's uh, Nunchaga from the Kilimanjaro region. Beautiful region. Bananas. He goes to Mafia Island uh, uh, and he's persecuted. And Speed the Light did 10 water problems. Pastors, when he made a plea for you today, I was thinking, oh God, if they only knew, if you could only come and see. Sean has been there to see. If you could come and see what's happening. Pastor Dave talked about, I'm just telling you, get behind Dave, get behind Felicia, get behind Speed the Light, get behind BGMC. These things are making a difference. Dave Lash was one of the best missionaries I've ever met. And I'm not saying that because he's here tonight. I said that when I got back, I told our pastor staff, it's, they got a great man there. These things make a difference. They count. They matter. Moshe went there, and he was harassed. We did 10 water projects, helped him plant some churches. We're about to build a birthing center. And again, this is confidential, folks, because Pastor Moshe and Barnabas and Tokambali told me it's true that they literally are killing Christian babies when the women come in to give birth. So I'm building a birthing center. I said, are you sure it's not medical malpractice because they're so poorly trained? And he said, no, some of them have intentionally been killed. And I said, I, I, it's hard for me to believe that. And he said, believe it. I called him Tokambali, mate, and, and he told me it's true. This man has been, he lost his wife. I was there, I prayed on his wife's deathbed. She was just bloated up. Uh, her kidneys had already shut down. And uh, she was supposed to die any moment now. Well, she lived another couple of months after that. And uh, she said, I'm not going anymore back to Dar for dialysis or anything else. I want to die here on Mafia Island where we've been doing our work. This is the kind of sacrifice people are making for the sake of reaching unreached people groups in places like this. Our missionaries deserve our prayers and support. Our national pastors need you to pray for them. They're being persecuted in places like this. And uh, they sent some guys, some young people went to Moshe's house to do harm to him. And uh, <coughs> they came at night. 
but nothing happened. But the next day, the police came to Moshe's house to search for the weapons. And Moshe said, I don't have any weapons. I've never had a weapon. I don't know what you're talking about. You're welcome to come in my home. If that's what you want to do is search, but you won't find any weapons because I don't have any. They went in, they did a little search. They didn't find anything. And he said, why are you doing this to me? And he said, well, there were a group of young men that came here to do damage to you last night to harm you. And they said when they came, they saw men with AK-47s standing around your house, standing guard. How many believe that the angels of the Lord encamp about those who love God and bring protection? Do you believe that? I believe it. If it's written in the Word of God, I believe it. Amen. Power for miracles. Our God's doing miracles. He's still doing miracles. I can tell you about Dolphy and Gill and the witch doctors that have cursed the projects. We started drilling in a place called the Toga, and where Nate knows he's friends with Dolphy and Gill. He can testify to these things. He's seen them with his own eyes. Witch doctor dominated society, 250,000 people, 1% literacy, 1% had heard the name of Jesus. And uh, I'm just telling you, uh, these, these folks went through so many things. But the witch doctors had cursed the water projects. So we drilled all of these wells and we weren't getting any water and I had used up all of the funds that had been given. And I said, we're not going to quit. And we begin to pray and Dolphy and Gill begin to rebuke the spirit because they're dealing with evil spirits who want to see people held in bondage. They don't care that five out of every ten the Tolkien children were dying of waterborne illness like we heard this morning in Burundi because they didn't have clean water. They don't want the gospel to go out. They want to hold power over the people. They begin to pray. And God supernaturally did miracles. And this witch doctor came to Jesus. We'll go into the whole story because of time. But I want you to know that after that, we now have 22 water wells, 22 planted churches, and Joyce Meyer has built six schools that are housing 2,000 children, all being educated by the Tanzania Assemblies of God because our God does miracles. Amen. Powerful wisdom. Let me just say this, though. When God moves and supernatural activity increases, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is, is something that we will see transform our churches and communities because when supernatural activity increases, when the move of God is at a church, people begin to come into your church. Almost all the passages and acts you see, and the Lord added to that number. Every time something happened, more people came in. The miracle at the gate. Read the book of Acts. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. The same word. And power. Dunamis. And he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. You see? For power for wisdom. Acts 6.10, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. We're talking about Stephen. He had a wisdom that came from the Holy Spirit. And we're talking about wisdom, a practical application of biblical wisdom to the issues of life. Stephen preached a great message. I read it today again. Stephen made it clear that it's not about the land to all those that were listening before that Sanhedrin and all those religious leaders. It's not about the land. It's not about the temple. He recounted the history. I mean the wisdom of them and how he brought them. And what he did is he pointed them all ahead to Jesus, to God. It's all about the power of God. That type of preaching. We need, we need that. We need wisdom. Some of the things that you have to deal with. I mean, you know, they don't train you for all of these things in Bible college or in uh, evangel or any of our school. You're not trained for all. Some of these things 
You, you can be uh, educated, but you deal with things. And you, I tell you, it's something when you can say, oh, God, give me wisdom. Uh, James said, you like wisdom, ask of God. He'll liberally give it to you. Wisdom. Amen. We have so many pastors that make mistakes. My dad was a superintendent for 24 years. And it just they lacked wisdom in some of their decision-making process. And had they stayed filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with wisdom and power, a lot of the things could be averted. We need wisdom. Moving quickly. It's power. Power for divine appointments. We know the story of Philip where he goes down to the desert place, to Gaza. And uh, there's an Ethiopian eunuch there. He's a court official of the Candate, Queen of Ethiopians, who is in charge of her treasure. And he had a divine appointment with that Ethiopian eunuch. And you know the story. He was reading the scriptures in Isaiah, but he didn't understand what he was reading. And Philip presented Jesus Christ to him, and then he baptized him in water. And then the same spirit takes him to Azotus. Powerful. Power. This is the book of Acts. I read it frequently because it brings encouragement and comfort to me. A divine appointment. You know, I had a divine appointment. I was going to Chicago. And I got, I had an early morning flight. I got there and I was taking the train from O'Hare downtown for a meeting. And uh, it was early and I was tired. And uh, I get on this train and it was fairly empty. So I spread out, I had my room there. And all the train, this old guy, or a young guy, I should say, but he was, he, he was dressed in old, dirty clothes. <coughs> and he comes and he sits right by me. And I think, oh, what in the world is, huh? And then he pulled out a, a Bible, the New Testament, a blue one, a Gideon one. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Yeah. First of all, I was convicted. Uh, and I looked at a young man and I said, do you know what you're reading? And he said, no. And I said, let me explain it to you. Right there on that train, from O'Hare, downtown to Chicago, I led him to the Lord Jesus Christ. His name is Justin Avila, I'll never forget. I tried to fix him into a church and all of that, connected him with some of the people that I know. A divine appointment. God has divine appointments for us. And sometimes, we just need, I don't know. We get so tied up in so many things. Jesus just wants us to love souls. Wants us to love people. And that's what the power of the Holy Spirit will do. The power of the Holy Spirit will help us solve problems. Acts chapter 6. We read that brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of spirit of wisdom. And when we return these responsibilities over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. We're talking about the Grecian and uh, Jews and, and the Hebrew Jews and the widows that weren't getting what they wanted. It was a big problem. It could have divided the church. But people who are filled with wisdom and this Holy Spirit are able to solve these kind of problems because they're instant in season. They have a word for every situation. It's power to give. And we read that they sold property and possessions to give anyone who had need. All believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. Now that we call that stewardship today. Like everything belongs to God. But that's what happened when the power of the Holy Spirit came upon the people. Read it in Acts 2, 43. 245 and Acts 432, you'll read about these because when the power of the Holy Spirit comes on people, they want to share what God has given them. You want to see an increase in giving in your church? Start preaching the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I believe that God will give you an increase and in power for a greater love for God and His people. The Spirit 
And the power of the Spirit helps us grasp the enormity of God's love. Because we're not the focus of what God wants to do. No, He wants to work through us. Love God more, love people more. The gifts without love are nothing. We know 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You can give up martyrdom, you can do all these different things, but if you don't have love, you've missed it. William Seymour said this, I quote, the Pentecostal power, and I'm asking the worship team that they come up, Caitlin and your team, if you could come up here as we close. They did such a marvelous job ushering us into the presence of God. So appreciate that, that I told Caitlin uh, that God has a, a touch on your life and a prophetic word, and I'm so glad to see this. And this is why we need the power of the Holy Spirit in every aspect of our church. We need it in our worship service, in every area, the power of the Holy Spirit. Seymour said this, he said, The Pentecostal power, when you sum it all up, is just more of God's love. It does not bring more love. If it, if it does not bring more love, let me say that again. If it does not bring more love, it's simply counterfeit. Wow, that was William J. Seymour. Now let me close by this. Any move of God or work of God is a fulfillment of His Word. He promises power and He gives power because the promises He makes are promises kept. It's not as enough to see God work around us it's nice to hear the stories, but it's not enough to see God work around us. We must allow God to work in us. Amen. And God wants you to experience His power afresh in your ministry. All were filled in that upper room. All were filled. And God wants to use you. There's no spectators here. Everybody needs to get into the game. God wants to use you to perform signs and wonders and miracles. That's why he gave you the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is why he called you into ministry. Remember, he did not tell his disciples to pray for the sick. He told them to heal the sick. Wow. And if there has ever been a time when people need hope, it's when they're in the midst of sickness. Because we have a God that's all powerful. And he has taken what he gave to his son Jesus. And he has given us that opportunity. For he said, I will fill you with the Holy Spirit and with power. Hallelujah. Miracle, working, power. And I tell you today that your churches will grow like they grew at each miracle when you start laying your hands upon the sick and praying for people. And people are going to be healed, they'll be touched. Not because you have power, but God has all power. And He is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. And by His wounds we are healed. Believe that. Believe that. It's still not by might and not by power, but by my spirit. And it's not our might and it's not our power, but it's by his power, his spirit working in us and working through us. We need a fresh touch. We need a fresh anointing. Where the ordinary becomes extraordinary under the power of the Holy Spirit. And God wants you to have supernatural power in your pulpit, in your ministry, in your preaching. We need more than information and programs and ingenuity. Those are wonderful things. I'm all for that. But I'll tell you, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm challenging you to share this with your people. They need power. They need power to, to go to their neighbors. They need power so they can be ready to do the work of God when the time comes. They need power. God wants to work in you. He wants to work through you. I'm going to ask Pastor Dave to come up here. I believe, and I told him as I was praying and seeking God, 
I said, there are people here that need a, a healing touch in their bodies. People have come here. Some have had some bad reports. Some are concerned about a lung. Some are having difficulties. There's people with scoliosis, with back problems. Can I tell you that the Lord is here to heal you tonight? Amen. Tonight is your night for healing. And then let me say this too. That every one of us, including me, I need a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. Because I pour out, I want to continue to pour out, but I need God's fresh touch. Because I do leak. Oh God, tonight, tonight do.